and bringing us together to ponder upon thy words, to seek thee, and with your help, Father, to come to thee in Ruach and in Emmet. Thank you, Abba, for Eric, and thank you for the family that has provided us. Amen. Amen. April 21st of uh, 2024 here. So we're going to be spending a few weeks talking about the book of Revelation. And one significant matter in the book of Revelation is the number seven. And some people say, well, seven is their favorite number. Why? Well, I don't know. So they don't know. I've heard that answer, but it's just they, they find a, an affection and attraction. A, kind of a, an affinity with the number seven compared to whatever other numbers. And in Hebrew, words have more than one meaning quite often. So, for example, the number seven, spelled shin bat ayin, also means other things. Like the word five, which would be hamash, het mem shin, also means to be armed and equipped. The word three, shalish, shin lamed shin, means to be an, an intermediate relay between two other. So shin lamed shin. You could almost see that, well, the Lamed is an authority or that which joins this one to that one as an arbitrator, this Sheen to that Sheen. Sheen Lamed Sheen is number three. Sheen Sheen is the number six, which also, the number six also means white and it means rejoicing. Two, the number Shani, Sheen Nun Yod, is also the color red and it also means to be different or variant. Four, which is the number Dalit, is the letter Dalit also. See, those other words are not the names of the letters, but Dalit happens to be the number four. Well, no, I think Arava is number four. That's right. Now it's the fourth letter. Anyway, it uh, that word uh, for the number four means to be um, like springtime when things become prolific and fertile spring you know everything coming back to life the rains come and soften the soil and the, the sun's out and warming up and then everything starts to uh, procreate that's the number four the word eight is uh shemen shin mem noon which means fat oil grease shemen but it also means Sheen can be seen as a prefix of mem noon. Mem noon is manna. Where did this come from? Or what is this? Sheen mem can be the word for name. So sheen mem noon is like, what's this? Be about the business of considering, appraising, evaluating. It's a synonym with the word Ayn Reshkov of Eric. Aleph, the number one. Well, that's the number one. It means taught, trained, and domesticated. Rashon is the number for first. which is foundation and head. It's also pinnacle. So what, what I'm saying is that when you're looking at words and your your mind will go to, oh, I know what that word is. And it's like, yeah, but in what context? Is it the number four? Is it the fourth place? Is it the name of the fourth letter? What what about the fourness is this referring to? So the the, the point is, the, uh, and how we're going to look at Revelation here just for today is that uh, it's your own contemplation. It's your own study. So for years, I read the Bible, whether it was because you're in school at a, in a class where they say, now read these chapters, or you're doing your own reading of the Bible, you know, have a Bible by your bed and sit there and read a chapter or two when you, before you go to sleep or you wake up or when your time of study or think about the bible so you think about like psalms 23 the lord is my shepherd i shall not want don't think about that well and when you're thinking about it in english you're trapped in the world that the english allows it might be pretty big but you're still trapped within what the english allows i remember years ago there was a fellow it was back in the uh 70s i believe it might have been the early 80s but anyway he 
was a shepherd. I think he was living out in uh, the Puget Sound area of Northwest Washington State, I think, or some island. Anyway, the point is, he was a shepherd, and he wrote a book called Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And he says, you know, I'm out here with these sheep, dealing with the same matters that David wrote about in Psalm 23. And so he elaborates on every phrase, every condition of concern and regard that the shepherd has for the sheep and him being a Christian believer, he kind of lets it blossom a bit and open up. And I remember it was a pretty popular book when it first came out. It was like, hey, what a what a great concept. He, because he had that occupation, he was able to break out of the English constraint of translation and give the audience, the reader, a regard that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And what I'm suggesting is that uh, looking at the Hebrew, knowing the Hebrew, regarding the Hebrew, will do the same thing. It will break open into a zone, a different orbit, you might say concentric to bigger, like rings of a target. It's like a whole nother ring, a whole nother orbit. And then in looking at the Mishkan pattern, boom, that, that just blows out a whole nother orbit, a whole nother expanse of consideration. And so I was going to go through the, the first, uh, if we can get there, first 10 chapters of Revelation here with an overview of the Mishkan pattern to say, okay, it's one thing to say, okay, I, I, what is the pattern and how can you prove it? How can you identify it? And I had mentioned that I'd seen it in back in 2004 at Sukkot. I, I wrote up and presented people papers of 50 pa places, pa each place a page with an overlay. You could line up the pattern. And then after Sukkot, I printed up 20 more and gave them to people. And then I found 500 places or so and didn't write them all wrote up many of them but it's like there's too many to write well it's it's worthwhile but it's it, it's like is this just my own thinking in my own mind in which case well other people should recognize for themselves or maybe they disagree or say oh that's not that's not a real thing you're just inventing that or imagining you see that well maybe but anyway we're going to talk about an application to say, well, what if it is legitimate? What if this concept of the Mishkan pattern is really Yahuwah's design? And instead of arguing whether it is, let's assume for the moment, postulate it, pose it as a given, and then say, how does that apply to these other matters where you'll find the number seven? Because the Mishkan pattern basically has a set of seven, but then there's a, another one before it and after it, which makes it a package of nine. If you could take those two in consideration, almost like covers, besides being within the Aleph Tav, which is another cover. So the word Shava, Shin Bet Ayin, the number seven, page 636 in the Red Dictionary, to be sated, to be satisfied, to be replete, full, surfeited. And I think surfeited, surfeited, S-U-R-F-E-I-T-D. What does that word mean in English? Well, why do they call the surf not just only what you do, but you surf the surf. The surf is where the water meets the land and the waves crash and you get the white foam bubbling up. It's on the surface, surf, the surface of the water has an abundance overflowing and billowing, as it were. The clouds, almost the cloud aspect of this white foam from the salt water. So this concept of replete, sated, full, well, that's at maximum capacity. And then it triggers a thought, hey, there's a verse where it says that Elohim when he measures something else, it, it's good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. If you're, say, taking flour or even coffee, if you grind some coffee and dump it into 
an aero press, for example, and you're trying to get a certain volume of coffee grounds, it looks like you've got maybe an inch, but you tap that thing down, it shrinks down to half. Why does it do that? Well, you got to pack it down. Well, but is it at full volume if it looks like an inch or is full vol volume actually a half an inch? Well, it's still full volume. Some people, when they'll, you buy a cord of wood, for example, and they'll stack it loosely. So there's a lot of air that helps it dry out. But if you pack it in there, you'll find that they're only giving you two thirds of a cord. And they might say, hey, it's a genuine, it fills the volume. And it's like, you know what you're doing and you know you're ripping me off and I'm not going to buy it from you unless I have to. If I find myself in a circumstance of necessity, I'll get it from somebody else who gives me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, solid at maximum capacity. Well, why wouldn't somebody do that? Well, they've got something to gain at your loss. But see, Elohim has nothing to gain for our loss. He's the source of everything. So his measure is, I'm going to give it to you all. I'm going to give you everything I said. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing, then is the description of what Shin Berain represents. The number seven then is not just seven. It means to be satisfied, surfeited, replete, full, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. So it's not just then when you see the number seven, it's not just, oh, the perfect number seven. People assume it is, or hey, I just have fun for that number. Well, but it means Boy, you get absolutely everything, but it's overflowing, overflowing like the the body of water and then the bubbling foam. You you pour a beer or a root beer into a cup, and then the carbonation sometimes it'll flow over. You shake it up and roll it. That's a picture of sevenness. And if you read some more, you get uh, plenty. Full abounding. Surfeited, fill, abundance. But it also then, page 637, it means to swear, caused to take an oath, adjured, bound by an oath. If you go to court and like you see in movies and television, somebody's going to take the witness stand and they hold up a Bible. At least they used to. I don't know what they do anymore. But put your hand on the Bible, raise your hand and swear. You swear to tell the whole, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you God. Okay, that's what they say. And it's like, ooh, oh. if you swore to tell the truth, yeah, but maybe not so much. Oh, there's got to be the whole truth. Well, okay, but all, and nothing but the truth. Oh, gosh. So help you God. Oh, okay. Well, see, back in those days, back in the olden days, people used to be really afraid of the spiritual consequences of offending. Who is it? Well, whoever it is, say you don't identify who it is, but see, politics has always used religion as the enforced fist. And it's like, if the, if the politics can't intimidate you with the military muscle, the police, they can intimidate you with the threat of going to jail with taxes. They could, but they'll really can intimidate you if they use the church, the religious belief. You're going to go to hell if you don't tell the truth. And we may not catch you, but whoever the, the Elohim, whoever the God is, he'll, he knows. And you're going to pay big time forever if you lie, especially if you put your hand on a Bible or a stack of Bibles. Two or three Bibles, seven Bibles. If you if you put your hand on seven Bibles, man, and you tell a lie, you're done. You're dead meat, as they say. Oh gosh, okay. So, but you have to build that fear and uh, respect into the population's inner soul of consciousness, so that they will govern themselves. So, in the chessboard, as I've mentioned before, you got the king and queen, and right next to the king and queen, you got the bishops. That's the church. And right next to the bishops, you've got the knights. That's the military, the police. And right next to them, you've got the, the castles or the rooks, which are the institution. And it's like, well, building, a structure, a building of institution? Well, in my mind, it's like, well, it could be a courthouse. It could be a jail. It could be 
science laboratory. It could be medical establishment. It could be the university. It could be the educational. It's the. Well, all these are institutions. The. Uh, what is it Eisenhower said? The military industrial complex. It's like, oh, yeah, those guys <laughs> in, the, in the castles and then the row of attorneys. Armor, the shield bearers out front, esquires. Well, that's that that chessboard setup really represents. Earthly dominion. So why are the bishops right next to the king and queen? Man, they use they use whatever whatever the religion, even if it's fake or false or invented or wrong or true or the Catholic or Orthodox or Islamic or Hindu. That religion keeps everybody in line. I'm just saying then that the idea of to swear an oath only really works if the person who's swearing the oath believes that there's some value in doing the swearing or there's some harm if you break the vow. So if back in the olden days, I don't know, my grandparents era say, when you make a marriage vow, if you break that vow, you're in big trouble. For eternity, you're going to be paying for that if you break that vow. And then in my lifetime, it got to be, well, if, boy, if somebody was divorced, it was the most horrible thing. There was, remember when I was a kid, there was somebody who, had, who was married in the church, an older couple. And I remember hearing some rumor that, hey, one of those guys had been divorced, man or the woman. It's like, what? That's right. They're adulterers. Wait a minute, they're Christians, they've been married for decades and they're in the church. And it's like, never get past that. If you were divorced and you marry somebody else, you're, you're an adulterer for eternity. What? Well, that used to be the thinking because you swore a vow and you broke your vow. And then it was like, well, is there forgiveness or not? Yeah. And, then, and then there's this concept of justified justification, big, big, Presbyterian world justification. And remember, no, it, it breaks down justified, just as if I'd never done it. Well, if you're justified by the blood of Christ, how can you still be considered an adulterer if you found yourself a long time ago or somebody else did where they were in an unfortunate or disturbing situation or irreparable and for whatever reason they got a divorce and here it is, they've They've been baptized, they've been atoned for, they've been cleansed, they believe, they've lived a life of uh, pious, orthodox obedience to the covenant, and yet you're still going to say, well, you weren't completely cleansed, not even by the blood? Well, yeah, we believe you were, but not in this case, you're still a scoundrel, and you're still going to pay for it in, for hell and, or lack of treasures in heaven, because it's like, what? Who gets to make up the rules? of when something's really forgiven because he said you're forgiven or i remember hearing the the teaching that when you ask jesus into your heart he throws all your sins into the sea of forgetfulness and it's it's as far as the east is from the west any memory of it and you go i remember hearing somebody say one time um if you say gee uh Say I got mad and I kicked the dog and I should have uh, I should have been nicer to the dog. So please forgive me. You know. But the dog really deserved it. it was, and, he, and he would say, what dog? And you go, well, the one I just kicked. You kicked the dog, really? It's like, yeah, I just asked you to forgive me. Well, I forget. I don't know what you're talking about. What? What? What do you mean you don't know what I'm talking about? I just asked you to forgive me. Now I'm mentioning it again. Say, hey, it was thrown in the sea of forgetfulness as far as east is from the west. There's no recollection of anything you're talking about. And it's like, is that the way it works? Is, is the forgiveness we're offered for misconduct such that, and this is what I was taught, that as soon as you say, please forgive me, I plead the blood, it vanishes. And you shouldn't even bring it back up in a conversation or your memory or readdress the matter because it's just as if I'd never done it. It's gone. It's absolved. Well, how absolved? 
good measure pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing, completely absolved. So if that's the case, now other denominations might have had different uh, perspective on that. It's like maybe if you go to a uh, confessional with a priest, you'll say, well, you'll be completely absolved when you say certain words a whole bunch of times, or you go out and light some candles, or you go out and give some penance to the poor, then you'll be completely absolved. It's like, oh, okay, what do I have to do? And then other people say, oh, no, the blood was sufficient. And it's like, oh, okay. It's like, well, what are the mechanics of how it works? That's the big question, the reality of how it works. The idea, though, that you swear, you take an oath, you're sworn in, and because you're willing to swear, then everybody else in the jury and the courtroom and the situation is going to believe that you have a higher order of integrity that you're acknowledging. And that if you say, I swear, well, if you said, hey, I'm going to do this, do you promise? Yeah, well, see, if you don't promise, you just say you're going to do it, then it's like, well, it may not count. You, you might flake out. But if you promise, do you swear and promise? And then people, this was actually in the Gospels, where people are saying, not only do I promise and swear, I swear on my mother's grave. And it's like, oh, what does that mean? Well, if your mother hadn't died yet, you're saying that... It, if I break this promise, let my mother die. Or you, you might say, well, she's already dead and you swear on a grave, then what does that mean? Are you trying to say, well, maybe, maybe she should get poked with a pitchfork in the by the devil in hell if I if I break my vow? I mean, what do you what? Angels aren't going to torment you if you're in the heavenly. So what are you talking about? Well, I mean, I'm saying I've I've heard all this stuff throughout my life. Just kind of bring it up to a certain place. So people would say, well, I swear by the, I swear by Jerusalem. And somebody else would say, I ain't good enough. Swear by the temple in Jerusalem. Oh, okay. Well, I swear by the temple. No, that's still not good enough. Swear by the altar. Yeah, the altar in the temple. And somebody else said, no, I swear by the blood on the altar. That's where Yeshua said, you guys let your yes be yes and your no be no. Everything else is perversion, distortion, just twisted insanity. Stop it. If it's yes, it's yes. That's all that matters. So what? You see, we invent religious protocol. Well, then why does he say good measure, press down, shaken together and overflowing? Because when he says, Yes, that's what yes means. And when he says you're going to get cursed, well, Leviticus 26. He says, if you find my ways to be detestable, abhorrent, reprehensible, those are the English words appropriated to various Hebrew words, or if you have, you know, whatever, casual disregard, the curse is going to multiply by seven, just like your vow. Just like what vow? The only vow that that could be a reference of was back at Mount Sinai, where three times the people said, everything Yahweh says we will hear and we will do. Yeah, but did they swear a vow? That is the vow. Did they say, yes, by the blood? We swear by the blood. We swear by the Ark of the Covenant. We swear by the, by the mountain. <laughs> they said, everything Yahweh says we will hear and we will do. Boom. That's the vow. And Yahuwah said, Israel, I am your Elohim. You are my people. That's the vow. Everything else is color added to the structure. That's the skeleton. Everything else is flesh and sinew and fat and curves and but the bones of the matter is, Yahweh, whatever you say, we will hear and we will do. You're my people, I'm your Elohim. Well, what does that entail? That means everything we do and everything we need and everything he, in our life, he's the conductor of, now and forever. Do you get it? That's the simplistic seven 
So if that's the case, every time I see the number seven, seven of something, seven branched menorah, not eight or nine, seven. The seven branches of the menorah are making a statement. What's the statement? Relationship by vow. But see, the word doesn't just mean to bound by an oath or adjured. That's where you go to a jury. The jury is adjured, A-D-J-U-R-E-D, -E because the jury is bound by an oath to make the best moral, virtue, legal decision, guilty or not guilty, as they possibly can with all their human whatever they're gifted with, human, rational, logical, mental, emotional, the spirit of, he can't bring spirit, it has to be what he do and is he guilty? But I'm just saying, that's what it means to be adjured. So this also means to do something seven times, multiplied by seven, just the number seven. Sheen bet ion vav nun. Now I see if you're looking through the dictionary, if you add vav nun as a suffix, then it means satiety or fill. Well, if seven means to be satiated, this is the state of satiety. So by looking at the dictionary, you realize, okay, when you put a vav nun at the end of a word, like zion, zadi yod, vav nun, it's in the state of being satisfied, satisfaction, contentment. But then you look at, so What's Zadi Yod? Well, Zadi Vav is command. Zadi Yod, if Yod is pers makes it personal, then that's my Zadiness, my, my what? My command being done? Is that Zion, Zadi Yod, Vav Nun? See, so when I'm talking about my my efforts to understand what's being said, I'm trying to show you the nature of the contemplation. You can use the dictionary to a certain extent, but if you look in the dictionary at the word Zion, Zion, Zadi Yod Vav Nun, it'll say Mount Zion, and it, it won't tell you. It'll, it'll, it'll say it's also a billboard or something planted in and lit, raised up. It won't tell you that it's the act of my commands being accomplished. That has to be deduced or determined or deducted, deductive reasoning, not reduced, deducted, by breaking down the spelling of the word and looking at it. And I'm saying all this for a reason, this is where we're going with Revelation, the um, book of Revelations. So then if you look at Shin Bet Ayan Yod Mem, that will see that Yod Mem is plural, it means 70. Shin bet ayin yod tav is a septet in music, which is like a quartet is four people, a trio is three people singing, a duo, two people singing, but here a septet is seven people playing music together. Shin bet ayin tav yod mem is sevenfold or seven times. Well, it already said shin bet ayin was a group of seven. So this is almost a type of redundancy. And then you could say, well, Shin Bet Yod Ayan, seventh, the seventh person called to read. And if you look at Shin Bet Vav Ayan, weekly, oath or curse. Shin Bet Vav Ayan Tav, Shin Bet Vav Ayan Hey, an oath or a curse. Shin bet vav in a period of seven days, seven years, which would be a heptad. Well, see, we're in the midst right now, some of us, of shavuot. Shavu, shin bet vav ayin, shavua, vav tav, plural, shavuot. What is that? that? Well, that's counting seven sevens, which brings you to 49. And then the 50th day is... The day of Bikarim or first first fruits. See, here's another question. Waving the Bikarim, well, that's waving the, the, the cut 
no, that, that's waving the first sheaf. And then 50 days later, you're waving the loaf. That's what's called Bikarim. And if you look real close in the, I think it's in Leviticus 23, you can make that distinction. So in my take on Shavuot, is it's a 50-day festival. And what do you do for the 50 days? You count. Counting is the festival, and the festival is 50 days. Not everyone, but most people will tell you there's two festivals at this time. There's the first day, which comes right on the, uh, the day right after the Sabbath day, during the week of unleavened bread, where they, they go out, the priests go out, and they cut the first clump of barley, and they lift it up, they wave it up, and that's a non-work day. That's a moed. And then count seven sevens, and then it says count 50. So some people will count seven sevens, and then they'll count another 50. And then if you do the the uh, lunar Sabbath, seven sevens is not 49 days. Because a seven-day week, you have four of them, and then you got Rosh Kodesh and bonus day possibly thrown in. So that's at least one day, if not two. And then you got another three weeks. So that's actually 49, 50, or 51. And then you count the 50th. Or you'll count 49 days and then count 50 days. That's a total of 99 days before you have Bikarim, which is the day of Pentecost. And so people are trying to keep this calendar regard of Yahuwah's Moedim. It's like, gosh, what the heck? All this stuff going on. I'm, I'm just bringing it to your attention. This is the stuff going on. And then you've got to figure out for yourself, how am I going to do it? And this is why, because it's all in what do these words mean? So if you look at Shin Bet Bav Ayan, Shin Bet Yod Ayan, Shin Bet Ayan Yod, Shin Bet Ayan Vav Tav, those are all the derivatives. And then you stick other prefixes and suffixes, put a mem in front or a tav in front or a lamed in front or a hey, and, or, and it's like the more you look at all these words, you can sit there and say, okay, it's a concept. Yes, it is number seven, but it's a concept. You don't have to swear something seven times. You just say yes, and it's so. But if you do something seven times, it's a picture of yes upon yes, absolutely so. And then you hear, well, there's this tradition that a Jewish lady at the marriage ceremony will walk around encircling the groom seven times. Well, that's saying I do with seven exclamation points. It's just saying, yes, I, I take you as my husband. And I, pro and I promise to what? No, just, just yes. I swear it's a picture of, yes, I swear, I'm taking a vow. Well, so if the letter, se the number seven is the word that also means to be cursed by the oath, because the oath is not just a vow, it also carries with it a curse. Well, where it's really laid out most clearly is Leviticus 26. Go back and read that chapter. Now, if you're just reading the chapter, okay, I'm reading the Old Testament, blah, blah, whatever. I'm, I'm told to read the chapter, read it real fast, get through it. And what did it say? I'm not sure. I've got another two and a half minutes before my show comes on TV. So I was just reading it to get, so let's say I did. Now I'm, I, it's like, you can't read it that way. If you try to read something where you're distracted with other thoughts because you're going to do something else, you're never going to see it. So I'm suggesting if you go back and say, understanding that the number seven means to swear a vow. And if you break that vow, you're going to get cursed by seven by the vow, according to the vow. Well, does that mean you get seven times a curse? So in Leviticus 26, where he says four times, if you break this vow or you consider my ways, the breaking of the vow is that we consider his ways to be 
loathsome, abhorrent, re a reproach, shameful, disturbing. We just don't like it. Or we have a casual disregard. That is breaking the vow. So the vow is not just whatever he says we'll hear and we will do. But the vow is you better have a good attitude <laughs> with all your heart. With all your heart. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. From within, we will be his people. So if you find yourself with a lackadaisical heart or. Eh. I don't really like his stuff. You broke the vow. Yeah, but we were never taught to appreciate his stuff. Well, so part of what we're doing by being the people that we are right now is encouraging a good attitude, encouraging enthusiasm, encouraging a zeal Kuf Noon Aleph, jealous, zealous, fanatical about his stuff. And it's like, how do you be zealous about eating dry cracker bread without much taste for a week? Well, I know some people right now who are doing Lent you know, of the Orthodox faith. And they give up something. What? Well, give up whatever you want. Give up smoking and drinking and eating meat. Well, are those things bad? Well, not necessarily. Some people think they are. Some people think they're not. But if you choose to give those things up, why are you doing it? Where in the Bible does it say you got to give up smoking, drinking, and eating meat? It doesn't. You do it from your heart because you want to buffet the flesh, something that the apostle Shaul, Paul, made mention of, buffeting the flesh. You know, some people would wear scratchy burlap shirts. just more drove them crazy, they're buffeting the flesh, or they'll sleep on a bed of nails, or they'll go stand out in a freezing cold river to pray. Tormenting the flesh to refine the spiritual inner man. You don't have to do those things, but if you do those things, it's trying you're trying to get leverage over the natural inclination. The spirit man trying to usurp authority over the carnal man, as it were. Do whatever you want to do. But what he said was, do not eat leavened bread for a week in the springtime. Then your calendar is, you got to figure out when that time is. But that's what he said. So there's no place in the Bible where it says you got to do Lent and give up smoking, drinking, and eating meat. But what he said was, give up eating leavened bread for a week. And if you want to be his people, that's what you do. Yeah, but what if you do it for 40 days? Do it however long you want. It's got to be at least a week because he said so. Everything else is because you want to. Yeah, but the religious, the church authorities said, no, do it at a different calendar date for 40 days. Doesn't matter what they said. It's not what he said. I mean, you could do it if you want, but now that's just like, you're exercising. It's like I'm going to do, you know, 20 sit-ups when I wake up in the morning or, you know, 15 jumping jacks, you know, like when you're a kid in a PE class. And it's like, do, do whatever you want as your own exercise. But what he said was, did he say you have to fast one whole day at Yom Kippur? You know, the word ayanun hey means to respond, to sing, to pay attention and to make it your burden. It can mean not eating if you want to not eat. If you want to focus your attention on everything else, but it doesn't mean that you have to not eat. Zadi Mem means to fast from eating or drinking, and that's the word I noon hey, not Zadi Mem. So, and, and again, it's like, well, gosh, do you have to give up 10% of your income as a tithe? That's not what he said. What he said was store up 10% of your income and spend it on whatever your heart desires at Sukkot, because keep Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, in the autumn, that's the command. Don't work. That's the command the first day and the last day. And what you do in between, gosh, take the days off if you want. You don't have to. But first couple of years, I didn't. I realized I was ripping, my, ripping off my own life. Take the week off. It's like going on a ski trip with your college chums, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, you know, back in the day. And it's like, why just go the first day and the last day? Why not take the week off, rent a condo with your friends or their people from church and have a big whoop-de-doo party? That should be the festival of Sukkot. 
That's what you do with gusto. So all that, that attitude is supposed to be sheen bed iron. And if you break it by a casual ad- attitude of disregard, or you just really don't like his stuff, it's coming back on you seven times. Because when he says, this is the nature of the relationship, this is how the relationship works. Well, why? Because that's the way it works. That's what he built. So I'm suggesting that as you look at the number seven, if you look at Shin Bet Ayan and its derivatives, that you get a sense of who he is because he's encircled himself all over the place with the number seven. For example, well, in the book of Revelation, you got seven seals holding the scroll right there in basically chapter five and chapter six. There was seven days of creation in Genesis one. There's the seven Moedim, Leviticus 23. There's the seventh day, the Shabbat. You've got in the book of Revelation, right at the end of the seven seals, you've got seven trumpets. At the end of the seven trumpets, you've got seven thunders. You've got the seven bowls. You've got seven stars that he holds in his hand, which are the messengers or the angels of the seven churches, seven churches, seven ecclesia assemblies, seven, you got the lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of Elohim. You've got you've got the seven branches of the menorah. What is it all about sevens? Well, now, if you go to Daniel 9, 24, it says 77s have been appointed. 77s. But if you look real closely at the way it's written, Daniel 9, 24, it says, Sheen bet I and yod mem, Sheen bet I and yod mem. Well, that's the same word. Is it 70 or is it sevens? How many sevens? Well, see, the only way you'll know is if you look at the the could, the the vowels, the dots and the lines underneath the letters for the modern Hebrew, it tells you what it means. Is it the number 70? Is it the word sevens? It's something seven that's been multiplied. Yeah, but he said he was going to multiply the curse there in Leviticus 26, and you don't find out what that looks like until you go to Ezekiel 4, where he says, a day for a year, the curse on the northern kingdom is 290 days, 290 years. If that gets multiplied by seven, it's 2,730 years, bringing you to 2010. That's where that comes from. But what he said there in, in Daniel 9:24 is 77s have been appointed for your people. Okay, well, that's 70 weeks. Because Sheva, Shavua can also mean a week. Well, is it or isn't it? I'm suggesting forget that. Forget 77s and forget 70 weeks. Because as soon as you say that that means 70 weeks and it's talking about the tribulation, three and a half weeks, you got 69 weeks in the last week. Above, we've had, we have had 2,000 years of Christianity telling us that's what it is. And maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. But I'm suggesting let's forget that for a minute and simply look at Sheen Bet Ayan as the word vow based on at Mount Sinai, our forefathers swore the whole entire family for perpetual generations without end. Everything Yahweh said we will hear and we will do. That that's the Sheen Bet Ayan. And if we don't, we will hear Shema. And we will do Ayan Shin Hei by Shomer Shin Mem Resh. We get the curse. And that's Shin Bet Ayan Yod Mem. Oh, that's plural. No, wait a minute. Look at the word Eloa. Allah. Aleph Lamed Hei is to deify. Eloa. Aleph Lamed Vav. Hey is Aramaic, or Daniel calls him Eloah. 
that's where the Arabic word Allah, oh, oh that's the Hebrew, that's the, um, that's the Islamic deity, which is different than the Hebrew deity. Ah, they call him Allah. It's the word Aleph Lamed Hey. It all refers to the the deity compared to the humanity, the other, the the omnipotent eternal one. Not his name. It's a title of description. His name, he told Moshe, was Ehie. Tell him Ehie sent you, but Yahuwah is going to be my name. My Shem prick sticks in your mind, pricks in your mind. Got a hook, a barb won't be pulled out. That's Yahuwah, but he is the Allah, Eloah. But why then is he called Elohim? Aleph, Lamed, He, Yod, Mem. You could put Aleph, Lamed, Vav, He, Eloah, but then they put a dot above the, above the Lamed, which, which gives you the O sound, Elo. Hey, Yod, Mem, Him, in which case, how many deities is there? Well, just, just the one, Yahweh Echad. But the Him, Yod, Mem is plural. So there's this concept. These are concepts that people wrestle with, trying to figure out what they choose to believe. If it's a multiple, if Elohim is a plural, then there's a multiple of Echad, of a singular. So that must be a, a Trinity reference. But other people say, no, there's no Trinity. There's one, Elo, 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 Elo. But he's called Elohim because that's a plural sound because it's called the royal we, the royal. I heard it said, you know, the king goes to eat at a restaurant and the, the waitress comes out, oh, what would you like to eat? We will have the we. How many of them are, how many of you are there? there well, there's just me and the mouse in my pocket or just, it's just me. But he says we speaking in the plural because the king is bigger and grander and multiplied. Resh bet means to multiply. Resh bet bet, rabav, rabbi. It's a multiplication concept of, of aggrandizement, of being bigger, greater, more significant, more important, and more numerous, but not necessarily number numerous. So what I'm trying to say is that this Hebrew concept of the yod mem plural, Elohim, it's not just a multiplied number, it's a multiplied regard of significance, of importance. And if that's the case, when you say the word Elohim, then when you look at the word Deborim, well, then that's not just multiple words. Well, just call it Deuteronomy and be done with it. Well, what's Deuteronomy? Well, D-E-U could be like the word D-E-U-X means two. D-E-U, it might mean referring to Dios, D-I-O-S in Spanish. That's that's the God reference, deity. But it's also two, which is to say again, another time. So you have the first time it was said in the first four books, and then the book of Deuteronomy reiterates it's Moshe's last speech before he dies. And so that's like the the the, the retelling. So it's Debar Im, plural, Yod Mem. Well, then, so what's the Shavaim? Is it 77s or is it saying, let's go over this again. This is the vow. This is the great vow. So when the angel speaks to Daniel, I think it might have been Gabriel in this case, probably, but he's speaking to Daniel and he says, 77s have been determined for your people. It's like, or is he saying the ultimate great vow of all vows has been determined as locking in everything else that's going to happen to your people. It's all about that vow, Daniel. Do you get it? And then he goes on to, to delineate what the vow is, which happens to be one of the places where the Mishkan pattern is found, right there. We, we've gone through that before. We can go again later, maybe next week if people want to. But the, but the point is, I'm just referencing that location. That's one of the places that the Mishkan pattern is found. But if you think of the Mishkan pattern as, well, here's this arbitrary little indexing categorization, well, okay, but it happens to line up pretty clearly exactly, in my estimation, with the verses following Daniel 9.24. But what did he say right before that in Daniel 9.23? He said, Het mem vav dalit, vav tav, well, the Vav Tav is plural. 
but het mem vav dalit chum chmod. Look at het mem dalit. Look at het mem is warm. Mem dalit is where we get the word for mode or made or like tailor made or something custom made or something stretched to fit. It's also the word for something desired, something that's considered to be a, a darling, a sweet one, a precious, something precious to you. You can look up derivatives of that word, but he says then the word ata, chamodot ata. Well, a plural of chamad? Well, see, it's translated, Daniel, you are loved. The word isn't ahava, it's chamod, chamodot, plural of chamod. Loved how many times, how many ways? See, again, there's the plural. So you have to understand in Hebrew, plural is not just quantity. Then for somebody to say, look, at shavayim shavim mean, means 70 weeks. Let's count them out. I'm suggesting that's not the limit of, you could count them out 70 weeks if you want, but that's not what it's saying. I'm saying what it's saying is the most significant, the most incredible aspect of relationship between Israel and Yahuwah is this vow, this vow of all vows, this great swear, the oath of not just fidelity, but enthusiasm. And he says to Daniel, Hamadodata, you are beloved. And then he says, Vebin Vav, Bet Yodnun, Bet Dalit Bet Resh, but the bar. And then he says, Vav, hey Bet Nun, Vaha Ben, and then Bet Mem Resh Aleph Hey. Your love, Daniel. Okay, that's tail end of what he said previously, but then he says, bean. Well, on the chart, you'll see in the middle of the right-hand side, two words are explained. One of them is bean, but you know, it's, it's Strong's Concordance number 995 and 996. Sometimes it just is translated the word between, between the evenings, bean ha erevim, bean, bet yod noon. What's the word bean? Remember romper room? The lady said, "Put your beanies on." You know, you know that little cap with the propeller, and it's like, "What's what's driving the propeller?" You're thinking, you know, your brain activity. You know, that's your beanie, beanie and Cecil, an old cartoon from way back when. Bean, one on the noodle, on the bean, on the noggin. That's your head. So what I'm saying is that we've got these words dragged through centuries of different cultures, and it comes from this word bean, which means think. Consider, understand, chakma and bina, wisdom and understanding. Bean means don't just believe it. Don't just say, yeah, 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 okay, but get it. It's translated. Contemplate the matter. The word matter is the bar. So here, the next word here is bet, dalit, bet, resh. So bet as a prefix means in, on, with, among, through, against, or in the condition of, for the price of, for the sake of. Bet is in consideration of the debar. But what's debar? Word, speech, matter, thing. But debar is also a raft pulled behind a ship, a trailer pulled behind a truck. Debar is also, looking in the dictionary, pasture, plague, that which follows. What If you get cursed for, not, for breaking the vow, for not doing what he said, what follows you not doing what he said is the curse, which is the plague. If you do what he said, what follows that behavior, that heart of enthusiasm, is pasturage. The place of provision, safety, refuge, the blessing. So debar is the words by which the vow is determined. Everything Yahweh said, we will hear and we will do. Everything Yahweh said, everything Yahweh debarred, we will shema and shomer and asa. And if we don't shema, 
then the debar of the debar is that we get cursed by plague and the misfortune, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and a bunch of other places talk about what it's going to look like, which looks like history of the planet, history of the world for the last, let's say, 3,000 years since David. And it looked like what was going on before the days of Noah, when he had to flood the place and kill everybody. And it's like, yeah, like that. If we don't do what Yahweh said, if we don't have a heart of enthusiasm as his people for appreciating what he said, walking in his ways with a proactive intent of, yes, I will, I want to, please correct my heart. What did Ephraim say? Jeremiah 31. After my stupid rebellion, I repented. I turned around and I regretted my behavior. And he calls out to Yahuwah and he says, bring me back and I will come back. I've had a change of heart. Help me get out of this pit, this despond, this despair, this rut that I can't get out. You need to help me get out. And Yahweh said to him, Ephraim, make road markers for yourself, stepping stones for yourself. Build the ladder, rung by rung. Conduct your heart on the way it should be walking. You know, that's kind of the same thing he said to Cain. Cain was kind of ticked off back in the days before he actually ended up killing his brother Abel. And he always said, hey, Cain, what's the matter? Why are you bummed out, man? <laughs> hey, don't you know? Have the right attitude and it'll go well. Sin's crouching at the door to get you. You don't have to give in to that. Just do the right thing. Well, he ended up not doing the right thing. He ended up killing Abel in big trouble. What's the right thing? It's found in the Debar. Yeah, but what does that mean? Well, to say it's found in the debar is to say bet is the prefix letter to the word debar, bet debar. It's in the debar. It's in the condition of the debar. And you need to bean it. You need to bean the debar. And then the next word, vav hey bet noon. Well, see, that's a derivatives of bet yod noon. But see, bet noon is also the word for sun, S O N, the male offspring of a of the parents not the sun in the sky but and i say that because the word shemesh is sun in the sky and that means a diligent servant which is the attitude of a good son is hey i'm gonna do what dad said i'm gonna do what dad wants just because he wants to and because i want to do it because that's what he wants so i'm gonna be a good son with the intention of being a good son i'm not just gonna hey i'm an independent entrepreneur autonomous, I can do whatever I want, my dad does whatever he wants, and I'm going to do whatever without regard of him. And it's like, father-son is supposed to have a different type of relationship. It's supposed to, in the ideal, have have one have has an eye for the other because of a special regard. That's the ideal. That's the potential. So as a son, but see the word to construct or to build, the construction trades is also known as bet noon hay, to build something. So to build something with the intention as a son of with understanding the words. I'll just do it because he said so. That's not even good enough. Okay, I'll do it with a good attitude because he said so. That's still not good enough. My dad, I remember hearing a conversation with my brother. My brother said, you know, they're a teenager, and he said, my dad said to do something. My brother said, why? And my dad says, because I said so. It's like, yeah. And I learned, never ask that question. Why? Why is asking for understanding's sake for my father to say, because I said so, has a degree of truth. I think it would be better if he gave the reason because it plays into Gabriel says to Daniel, Daniel, you have a job here. 
contemplate this matter, these words, with understanding. The last word, bet, mem, resh, aleph, hey, yo. Well, resh, aleph, hey means to see, to put on exhibition, to perceive. It also means he allowed himself to be seen. If something's on display, what do you mean he allowed himself to be seen? You can put a, a, a ticket at a, a price of entry at the door. You got to have a ticket. You got to get in. You got to pay a couple bucks. Or you can say, look, okay, everybody just come in. Or you can say somebody is camouflaged and it's like, hey, I'm going to allow you to see what I'm not letting other people see. So when Yeshua said, hey, who do you think I am? Oh, you could be John the Baptist or Elijah. Nobody knows you're some prophet. Or he said, who do you think I am? Oh. Peter said, you're the, speaking Hebrew, he wouldn't have said you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He might have said you're Mashiach, ben Elohim Chaim. And Yeshua said, oh, you didn't figure out that. You were allowed to see. You were allowed to perceive. Someone granted you special permission. That's Resh Aleph Hay. Bet is the prefix in the condition of Mem is also to put into solid form. That's a prefix. But bet mem is bima, bet mem hey, which is a theater, a set, a stage directing of orchestrate this whole matter. So if you go to Daniel 9, 23, and he says, on account of Daniel that you are greatly loved, or he could have said, see, het mem is warm, like affection, like the sun, Hamash is also Chet Mem Shin, the consideration of what the sun is. But then Mem Vav Dalit, where you get the mode, which is something, a fashion, a pattern, something that's fit, something that's appropriate, something tailor made. It's understanding how this stuff works. To sit there and do this study of the language where we see, oh, this is how it all fits together. This is how every letter speaks of his identity and his intention and of the covenant and what it means to be his people and why we have the Modim and why we have the Shabbat and who's the Mashiach, Yahusha, and how it all fits and how the 22 letters are not only his gospel narrative story, but it's this prophecy of what's going to happen to the people of Israel as a narrative of the story of the family. It's also a story of the earth. It's also the, the bones, the, the structure, the skeleton of the covenant. That it's, it's, it, it's the dynamic, it's the indexing of the nature of the relationship itself between Israel and Yahuwah. It's all these things. And to see that is Aleph Tov Paid is the Aleph Tov revealed, allowed to be seen. And Daniel had a warm affection for it, or he was allowed to be, he was allowed to see it, and he had a inclination to desire such things. The Aleph Tov paid, revealed, on display. And he understood. He could see it. He could get it. And he was then supposed to organize things in such a way as to make it perceptible regarding the great vow of all vows. Well, that's Daniel 9, and there's then seven things which fit the Mishkan pattern. And then in Daniel 12, as we've talked before, as I've tried to lay out where I see that the entire chapter, but for you, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book till the time of the end. Well, there's, there's his Aleph. Many shall run to and fro, knowledge will increase. There's something hidden in this bet here, tucked into this little, like wrapped up in a seed. I saw one on this side of the river and one on that side of the river. There's Gimel. 
saw one above the waters of the river dressed in white linen. There's Dalit. Hey, how long did any of these wonders? And he, the guy in the Dalit position, Vav, held his right hand and left hand, swore by him who lives forever. That's the Zion, that because that's the seventh letter Zion, and it means to swear. Those are the first seven. The other letters run out. So Daniel, did Daniel construct chapter 12 on purpose, or did he just give a narrative and just so happens that it fits the alphabet pattern? I don't know. It could be either way. It could be both ways. The point is, it works. At least in my estimation, it works. But if Daniel was told, there's a great vow that determines, determines everything regarding your people. What I was trying to say last week is that if you have in mind the Hebraic stuff, and you try to read the book of Revelation, you'll see something completely different than if you didn't. And for 2,000 years, we've had Christians dominating the interpretation of the book of Revelation because the Jews don't even recognize it. So you've had the Christian mind, the Christian eyes, seeing the book of Revelation, the words written in the book of Revelation, from the Greek perspective. Andrew Gabriel Roth comes up with the Aramaic English New Testament from the Aramaic Peshitta, and it reads a bit differently than from the Greek. Well, which is more accurate? I'm suggesting that if you regard the vow, everything Yahweh said we will hear and we will do, then you're going to read the book of Revelation even differently still. And I'm thinking that that hasn't been done, which is what we're about to do, stepping into it right here, because the vow, if the vow is retained by the 22 Hebrew letters of the alphabet, if the vow itself by seven is the Mishkan pattern, is held by the Mishkan pattern, then to see the Mishkan pattern is not just some interesting index or some, you know, whatever bogus way of registering, you know, what Eric thinks it is. It's like, oh no, it's the fixture of the Mishkan pattern, which is the vow. And then when you walk in the Moedim, keeping the Moedim, doing Passover, unleavened bread, Shavuot, and then in the fall, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Shemini Atzeret, you are keeping the vow. And if you're not doing the Moedim, you're breaking the vow and bringing the curse of all curses upon you, your family, your nation, your generation, and the planet Earth. That's how important this is. And so the people who then say, does Yahweh want us to keep these Moedim? Yes, it's the Shavuim, Shavuimim, the vow of all vows. Or is it the 70 weeks? 77s. It's everything. Let's do what he said. In which case, until we start to keep the Moedim, we're perpetuating the curse. We're perpetuating the alienation. And if he says, you know, how do you get back in right standing, Ephraim? Make road markers for yourself, stepping stones, rungs on the ladder, by which to conduct your heart on the way you should be walking. So not only do you have to be walking, you have to conduct your heart and you have to do something to get yourself out of the rut of being oppressed by your tormentors who will lie to you about everything. But first of all, they'll lie to you. Go back to the last thing that Moshe said in the Song of Moses. The very last words out of Moshe's mouth. He says, your enemies will try to deceive you, Israel. But who is like you that has such an Elohim and such a vow of all vows? Walk in my ways with a true heart, Israel, and I will be your Elohim and you're my people. So we're lied to, that it was done away with, that it was nailed to the cross, that it was... 
uh, something that nobody could ever do. We're lied to for us to throw it away or casual disregard or don't believe it or it's no good or we have a better covenant. All those are the lies that get us to disregard the Shiva of Shiva's, the Shavaim of Shavaim. Time to quit for the next hour? Yes, please. Okay.